morning guys, it's 6.30 in the morning on the 23rd of October 2018 and yes this is podcast number 27 which I've entitled Historic Pyrolysis. In my last podcast we looked at the concept and the practice of pyrolytic distillation. So it's not just enough to say that the old alchemists used pyrolysis and that it was the core technique that they made use of in the core alchemical path. We also need to provide some reliable evidence from a historical point of view that this is exactly what was going on. That pyrolysis is a core technique, that it did go way back into history, or at the very least that there are traces of the concepts associated with pyrolysis way back into history. And that this evidence at least throws some light upon the idea that what we're dealing with here is the core tradition itself of alchemy which is one of my main argument themes where the subject is concerned. So in this podcast this is what we're going to do is to look back into history at a number of examples of where pyrolysis has obviously turned up in the historic record and some examples of where the influence of the concepts surrounding pyrolysis and its philosophy or the philosophy that developed out of its use also appeared historically and in order to do that we're going to travel right back to the beginning of human civilization and work our way up toward Renaissance Europe. Okay, so I think this is about take number four. This time I think everything's running properly, so let's see how we go. So we're looking for supportive evidence here of the concept that the acetate path and the pyrolytic tradition go way back into history. And in order to begin to consider that question, we need to start at the dawn of civilization. And that means we need to go back to the Sumerian civilization. So we know that the Sumerians established themselves in Mesopotamia, but nobody is quite sure where they came from. And it's curious that as far back as we can trace their history that they seemed to have arisen as a civilization with all of the things required for a civilization intact in their society. Things like an understanding of mathematics, a written language, a system of warfare, organized warfare, a method of laying out cities and dealing with the administrative side of social life and city life, a well-formed religion, etc, etc. 
we also know from Sumerian records that much of the esoteric side of Sumerian civilization like the Sumerian mystery tradition had been passed down to a bunch of succeeding cultures such as the Arcadians and the Babylonians these civilizations developed out of the original Sumerian civilization and they adopted the methods of dealing with civilization from Sumer as well as adopting Sumerian esoteric knowledge. We also know that the Semites, a big part of which culture was the Hebrews, interacted with the later development of Sumerian civilization such as the Akkadians and the Babylonians. So we know that a good deal of Semitic knowledge and their esoteric tradition was originally taken from the Sumerians. So for example we know that some of the stories which are included in the Old Testament the Hebrew Old Testament actually had their origin in Sumeria and there are two very prominent examples of this one of them is the Hebrew legend of Noah and the Deluge this was not novel to the Hebrews the story or the concept that it's based on we know that the Sumerians had a very similar concept and story before the Hebrews did and that the Hebrews basically plagiarized this concept from the Sumerians and then built up their own version of the Noachite personality who survived the deluge and uh, is responsible for regenerating humanity and civilization after the deluge. Uh, this is common knowledge. I'm not going to go into the details of the Sumerian deluge legend, legend because it's easy enough to research this and it is a well known academic fact. The other story, which is curious which goes a long way to showing that the Hebrews took a, a lot of their esoteric ideas and religious concepts from the Sumerians is found in the life of a Arcadian ruler who went by the name of Sargon so he was like a king and he was king over the Arcadian Empire and Sargon uh, we know a reasonable amount about the guy because there are a lot of surviving written records on clay tablets in cuneiform text about who he was and his life and some of these records include uh, poetic stories about Sargon's life and one of those stories we are told that Sargon's mother got pregnant with him mysteriously and gave birth to him in secret and then had a basket woven which she waterproofed and put Sargon in and sealed up the basket and put it in a river and so he was washed down the river and discovered later and ended up having his life path completely changed where he ended up the ruler of the Arcadian Empire and of course anybody who is familiar with Old Testament literature knows that this is virtually exactly the same story that we're told happened to Moses that Moses mother had him in secret 
concealed him in a waterproof basket, put the basket in the Nile. It, he was eventually found floating down the Nile by a member of the royal Egyptian royal family and was raised as one of the um, Egyptian royal family. And because of this, he became an initiate of the Egyptian mystery tradition and then used th that basis f of his life um, in order to put himself in a position where he became a leader of the Hebrews and led them out of Egypt into the wilderness. So we know for a fact and academia also agree that the Hebrews took a whole bunch of their esoteric stories from the Sumerian tradition and we what we know from about this is uh, and from this is that there is a thread of a continuation of a mystery tradition between the Sumerians and the Semites and Hebrews and, and that this preserved tradition that threads its way through these various Middle Eastern cultures survived for hundreds of years around this early era. So indeed Abraham who was considered to be the father of the Hebrew race we are told in the Old Testament that Abraham was actually a high priest of Sumer and therefore he himself was an initiate understood the Sumerian esoteric culture and passed that on to the Hebrew nation also later in um, the Old Testament and in the uh, development of the Hebrew culture we find that the Babylonians which were a later development of Sumerian culture um, enslaved the Hebrew nation took them into captivity and so the the Hebrews again had an intimate contact with the Sumerian culture and through the Babylonians and revitalized very likely their esoteric understanding through this contact with the Babylonians. So if we refer back now to the previous podcast where I first presented the concept of the pyrolytic process and the tradition that grew up around it, the alchemical tradition that grew up around it, one of the things that I made clear from that podcast and from previous podcasts on the subject of the golden chain of Homer was that the pyrolytic process was seen by alchemists as a model of the process of creation, the creation of physical reality. Therefore, creation myths, I assert, and adepts from past ages have also asserted that creation myths therefore have an intimate relationship with the alchemical doctrine surrounding the process of pyrolysis. So if we look closely at the creation myths of Sumer, Arcadia, Babylon and the Hebrew and Semitic creation myths we start to recognize in them aspects of the alchemical tradition and specifically symbols which encode information about pyrolysis. So 
let's look at the Sumerian idea of the myth of creation or the legend of creation and the Sumerian concept of the legend of creation is recorded in seven tablets which are known as the Enuma Elish. Now I'm not going to go into the Sumerian creation myth in detail because the Enuma Elish is very fragmentary although from the pieces that have survived of the seven tablets we can tell a lot about the Sumerian concept of creation um, it would be messy and require a good deal of time for me to pick the Enuma Elisha part and make an academic example of why it is important alchemically. So we're just going to look at one quick concept here and that is the Sumerian mythological story of how the god Shemesh which is this guy here on the right hand side of this frieze stone carved wall picture this guy here is the Sumerian god Shemesh which is the god of the sun and therefore he represents heat and light and in this frieze he is battling with what the Sumerians referred to as the monster of chaos and we notice that the monster of chaos here on the left hand side of the frieze is basically a binary creature he's a symbol composed of two main um, cipher concepts one of them is the lion form that it takes on which we can see in the paws and in the face and a bird form and we know from studying alchemical um, mythology that the lion and the eagle both play very important roles in the cipher or symbolic language of classic alchemy the lion representing the fixed part of the process and that means minerals primarily and the eagle representing the volatile parts of the process which basically means um, spiritus type liquids and this creature therefore combines in its symbolism the idea of the fixed and the volatile as one unit and here we have a god representing light and heat wrestling with the monster of chaos now if we refer back to the golden chain of Homer it will be remembered that the original chaos the universal or Ur chaos is really an ocean of moisture that is composed of a liquid which is represented here by the bird feathers and a fire an internal fire which is represented here by Shemesh and when that fire is awakened on the part of the creator God that fire acts upon the chaos and out of it are separated the binary the ternary and then the core ternary the two poles of reality the three alchemic principles and the four elements this all happens because of heat acting upon the original chaos and that's what is depicted here in this freeze the god of the sun or heat acting upon or what the legend actually says is he is attacking or wrestling with the monster of chaos so we can see from even just this small piece of the Enuma Elish legend uh, 
that there are some very definite alchemical concepts encoded into that legend and so we could therefore put forth the argument that an at least a theoretical and philosophical understanding of alchemy could have existed in ancient Suma, which is four and a half, five thousand years ago that this legend was put into writing and also carved into beautiful pictures on the walls of um, municipal buildings and temples in Sumeria. And therefore, if this is a reasonable argument that alchemical knowledge exists in the Sumerian creation myth, we could then put forward the hypothesis that this knowledge actually came from a very early basic understanding of the pyrolytic process. Or that at this early stage, four and a half, five thousand years ago, the pyrolytic process, what actually happened in it and the products that were produced from it were already being compared to creation legends. But as I've already pointed out, it is my belief that the creation legends came from the pyrolytic process, not the other way around. This view, which I have put forward, is also strengthened by a couple of other things that exist in Sumerian literature and the most outstanding example of that is what is known as the Epic of Gilgamesh and here we see Gilgamesh as part of that epic story wrestling with a lion in a forest. Now we're not going to go into the details of the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh because that isn't the point in the discussion we can have here but it, it is useful to know that this is considered the oldest example, a surviving example of a story, a written story in human history, the Epic of Gilgamesh and that it was written about two and a half thousand years before the Christian era and there are a number of themes running through the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh but one of the most important threads of theme in the Epic is the concept that Gilgamesh is seeking to become immortal like the gods and alongside that theme is the concept that an elixir of life can be prepared manually from a plant and ingested and that it will extend human longevity. So in the oldest story that we have in human history, written story, Two of the really important themes that are explained in that story are the concept of attaining immortality or, or that it is possible to attain immortality and the idea that it's possible to produce an elixir of life by hand and ingest it in order to extend life expectancy. And of course both of these ideas, the attainment of immortality and the elixir of life, are key concepts in the alchemical culture. In fact, the two most important things about alchemy that the entire alchemical philosophy rests upon, the idea that the elixir of life exists and that a transmutation agent can be also produced. So here we have in the Epic of Gilgamesh two very important concepts which form the backbone of later alchemical culture.
the fact that these ideas exist in the epic of Gilgamesh, which is not just a fun story to tell children, but is also a story which encodes esoteric knowledge, we can say that it, the epic of Gilgamesh belongs to the same genre of knowledge and recorded information as the Enuma Elish. In other words, they're part of the esoteric Sumerian canon. And here we have a number of examples of alchemical ideas existing as part of this body of teaching. And they are wrapped up in common allegorical literature, the Epic of Gilgamesh is an example, and in the creation myth. Another important concept from Sumerian culture, which is tied up in this esoteric canon, can be seen in this frieze, and that is the concept of the Tree of Life, which in Hebrew tradition, in the Hebrew Kabbalah, the Tree of Life is basically the symbol for the esoteric teaching, esoteric body of teaching. So in this picture here we see four gods as well as the one of the uh, paramount gods of the Sumerians, Ashur, up here. And this part of the frieze here is the actual tree of life. And it even has, in its unusual form, a close similarity to the tree of life diagram used in the Hebrew tradition. One of the important concepts about this tree of life idea is that it is indeed a tree or a plant and when we look at the Epic of Gilgamesh the elixir of life that is discussed in the Epic of Gilgamesh is also made from a plant. So we see here in ancient Sumerian esoteric teaching the idea of the importance of vegetable life in both the esoteric doctrine and in the preparation of alchemical like remedies or products. So we also know that the Egyptian culture followed closely on the heels of the Sumerian culture. That the Egyptians took some of their concepts from the Sumerians or that both of those cultures, the Egyptian and the Sumerian, took their concepts from a single source that existed at the same time as those ancient cultures or previous to them. In other words, they may have had a common source rather than the Egyptians taking their concepts from the Sumerians. The general consensus though is that the Egyptians adopted some of their esoteric concepts from the Sumerians. So let's have a look at the Egyptian Genesis or at least one of the main versions of it and see if there are any similarities here. So the Egyptian Genesis is described in a text known as the Book of Knowing the Evolutions of Ra and of Overthrowing Apep. And of course Ra is the sun god, same thing as Shemesh, and Apep is the monster of darkness and chaos. And we've already seen in one of the depictions of the mythology of the Enuma Elish, the sun god overthrowing 
or wrestling with the monster of chaos. So here we have the opening passage of the book of the evolutions of Ra. These are the words which the god Nebuchadnezzar spoke after he had come into being. I am he who came into being in the form of the god Kephra. I am the creator of that which came into being. That is to say, I am the creator of everything which came into being. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar is the one source of creation, which we saw spoken about in the Golden Chain of Homer. Nebuchadnezzar translates into English as Lord of the World, and the word world is used in the same way by the Egyptians as it was for the medieval alchemists to mean created reality generally or a living system and not just world as the planet which we live on. It continues, the sky or heaven had not come into being, the earth did not exist, and the children of the earth and the creeping things had not been made at that time. I myself raised them up out of Nu. This of course is telling us that at the start of creation the earth was without form and void, to use a term or phrase that we also see in the Hebrew Genesis. In this way both the Egyptian and the Hebrew Genesis start off in the same way and they both adopted this concept of a voidless beginning to everything from the Sumerians. I la laid the foundation of things by Ma'at and Ma'at in Egyptian um, iconography, esoteric iconography represents science or orderly rules. The goddess Ma'at being the personification of natural law or rules and science. So in other words the god Nebuchadnezzar brought about creation not by accident or randomly but according to a very specific set of rules. I was one by myself for I had not emitted from myself the god Shu and I had not spat out from myself the goddess Tefnut. Nebuchadnezzar is telling us that he is the one source of created reality and that at this stage of creation he has not created Shu which translates as dryness or Tefnut which translates as moisture. Here we see that binary that was expressed symbolically in the monster of chaos in Sumeria by the eagle and lion combined being, dryness and moisture. So we can clearly see a reference in this symbolism to the universal fire and the universal watery chaos and how they are bound together at first. They are also the red fume or heat and the white fume or ardent water of the alchemists. I embraced my shadow as a wife and I poured seed into my own mouth and I sent forth from myself issue in the form of the gods Shu and Tefnut. And here we have some curious detail because Nebuchadnezzar tells us that in order to bring about binary nature from unity he embraced his shadow which is the Kabbalistic Nakash and Nakash is the intelligence or the 
universal software that brings about division. He embraced his shadow, which is the Kabbalistic Nakash. This then allowed him to produce Shu, the universal fire, and Tefnut, the universal waters. And there is a big secret tied up in this whole concept right here, which is hidden in the doctrines of medieval and renaissance alchemy. From the time when they, Shu and Tefnut, departed from me, from being one god, I became three gods. So we see here uh, a vague reference to the concept of there originally had been one thing, and then two things, and then three things. Here we see the Egyptian Genesis explaining the first manifestation of the three alchemical principles. These gods are of course intelligences, that is mind instructions or universal software, archetypes of the collective unconscious as Jung would have put it, and as such we see here the same concept as is described in the golden chain of Homer as the three conditions which the original universal fire had impressed upon it and the idea of mercury, sulphur and salt Shu being sulphur or dryness, Tefnut being mercury or moisture and Nebertetia being the alchemical salt which we see explained in the very next phrase where he says and I come into being in the earth and this is a really important concept too. So then the various manifestations of the elements were separated out from the original two fumes. Shu and Tefnut brought forth Seb and Nut and Seb and Nut brought forth Osiris and Hero Kent Amati and Set and Isis and Nephthys. At one birth, one after the other, they produced their multitudinous offspring in this earth. Four pairs of conditions exist in that statement. Dry and moist, hot and cold, fire and water, air and earth. And these are all the conditions that we see discussed in alchemical literature where the elements are concerned. And then there's a final pair which make up the fifth element or the quintessence. So there are a bunch of obvious connections between the Egyptian story about how creation came about and the Sumerian Enuma Elish. And then the next development of that story was the Hebrew Genesis. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And this is a blatantly Sumerian concept. It translates an alchemical iconography into the concept of in the beginning there was the universal fire or heaven and the prima materia. These are the fixed and the volatile. God is unity. The fixed and the volatile are the first binary. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The earth is the prima materia, the original chaos without solid form and it was void or non-physical as well as being dark light because light ha hasn't been created yet. Then pyrolysis begins and the white fume, spirit of God, moves upon the surface of the chaotic waters.
These are not only Sumerian concepts from the Enuma Elish, but they're also blatantly alchemical. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. This is the Shemesh or Ra, which acts upon the chaos. The red fume, which comes after the white. It is red mercury, or philosophic sulphur, the heat and light principle. God moved the particles in the watery chaos and friction between those particles manifested the hidden universal fire out of the core of chaos. The result is eventually heat and light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So God, the great alchemist of the universe, divided the white from the red fume. He called the red fume day, and in alchemy, this is why we call the red fume soul, or the sun, and the white fume he called night or Luna. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Alchemically, let the two waters, red and white fumes, because they are watery substances when they are concentrated, condensed, let them be divided or distilled, and from the original binary, the two poles, let us now have four things, two pairs. In this way, the four elements arise. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. So the grosser waters, the ones that were at the bottom or under the heaven, were treated in such a way, coagulated basically, in order to produce earth. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. So the element of water is coagulated, and in this way the last of the four elements is created, which we see referred to as dry land. This is exactly the same as the way the Egyptians described the process, that eventually a mound of dry earth arose upon which a falcon alighted at the beginning of creation. Notice that in Genesis this entire process is described in 10 verses and that the 10th verse is about the earth being established and remember that the 10th Sephiroth in Kabbalah is Malkuth or the physical universe. So it's not hard for us to consider that these first 10 verses of Genesis encode a kind of alchemical doctrine. For a start, it all is a matter of talking about God manipulating substances or conditions in order to produce certain substances or conditions. So this isn't unlike an alchemist turning nothing into something, or producing or creating a reality out of an, a, an unmanifest or chaotic state in the beginning. We also see that it's Sumerian in its origin, this is academically accepted, and if we read through carefully 
a good deal of classic respected alchemical literature from the last 2,000 years we can see a number of alchemists there making reference to Genesis in the Old Testament and aligning alchemical concepts so even the old alchemists and adepts themselves wanted us to understand that Genesis was describing an alchemical process and they weren't just saying you know what we're doing in alchemy is a model of creation and here we see the macrocosmic story of creation in the Old Testament but they were also talking about the existence of a tradition they wanted us to understand that whoever the authors of the Old Testament were and whoever put together um, Genesis these people or that person had access to an alchemical understanding of the nature of reality and specifically the alchemical concepts that they had access to were in line with and part of the pyrolytic tradition because they're not discussing other paths that we know about in alchemy here they are specifically describing a path which is connected with the concepts associated with the pyrolytic tradition so now let's jump forward in history into medieval Europe and the Renaissance particularly and see how these ideas which were originally encoded in creation myths and that's how these alchemical teachings were handed down and passed along then became part of the Western European Hermetic tradition so one of the oldest well-established systems of Western Hermetic alchemy was taught by a guy called Arnold de Villanova and he wrote a book or more accurately he originally had a series of woodcuts printed that were bound into a book and they didn't have text associated with them first of all I believe originally it was just a pictorial book and it was first published in 1550 but Arnold de Villanova himself lived during the 1200s in the 13th century so that means he was living a hundred years after alchemy very first came into Europe which was on the 11th of February 1144 hundred years it took for alchemists to start understanding what alchemy was and to start studying it seriously and for the first inklings of a solid Western alchemical tradition to be born and Arnold de Villanova was one of the first guys who was publishing knowledge from this developed Western view of the alchemical tradition so the first plate or the first print in his book is this diagram here which is known as the fountain of the philosophers and we know that the rosarium philosophorum which Arnold de Villanova wrote sometime in the 1200s possibly but was published by 1550 that's the beginning of the Renaissance we know that this book the Rosarium Philosophorum is telling us about the acetate path or the pyrolytic tradition because the very first plate here is a diagram which shows us two fumes rising out of the earth which is down here and these two fumes one is red and one is white and the red one is signified by the Sun and the white one is signified by the moon 
we also understand the philosophy that's going on behind the Rosarium and the process which De Villanova was teaching us because he starts here at the top of the diagram with a picture of a two-headed serpent. The circle in the middle represents unity and these two heads represent that unity dividing itself into two spirits or streams. This is, by the way, almost the same symbol that we see carved above the doorways on the lintels of the doorways into Egyptian temples, which uh, the Egyptian version shows a sun in the middle that has wings and two serpent heads rising out of that sun. That Egyptian symbol is the same thing that is meant by this later alchemical symbol in the Rosarium. Unity dividing into two fumes or spirits represented by these fumes here and labelled with the sun and the moon. We'll also see that there are five stars in this picture. One, two, three, four, five. And they represent the five elements or the four elements and the quintessence or fifth element and that two of these elements are in the red fume and two of these elements are in the white fume and that the fifth element or quintessence is associated with unity. We won't go into detail here about the fountain symbolism but it basically represents the original chaos and the three waters which are associated with that chaos. So one of the things we see uh, written in the Rosarium about this first plate is this passage. We are the beginning and first nature of metals. We. And he's ta talking about these two fumes. Art by us maketh the chief tincture in other words, the tincture, which is the Philosopher's Stone, is made from these two fumes. There is no fountain nor water found like unto me. I heal and help both the rich and poor, but yet I am full of hurtful poison. <clears throat> so, the waters from the fountain which are part of the alchemical process, have poison in them and need to be purified. So part of the alchemical process is the purification of these waters and these fumes. The juices of Lunaria, Aquavitae, Fifth Essence, Spirit of Wine, Mercury Vegetable are all one. So the author is telling us that when other alchemists mention each of these things, they're talking about the same thing. The juices of Lunaria are made of our wine, which thing is known but to few of our children. And with it is our solution made, and our potable God, gold is made, that being the mean thereof cannot be without it. So what the author is telling us here is that our children, being students of alchemy, few of them understand that the symbol of wine represents a substance which Lunaria, or a special solvent, is made that produces potable gold. And all of this basically is a very basic, simple, rendered down description of all of the important secrets about the acetate path and how it contributes to the alchemical tradition. Next, in 1540, 1550, 1560 or something around then, a man by the name of Leonhard Thurnesia, who was a German, 
uh, and a medical doctor of that time wrote medical manuals and one of the things he wrote about was a concept known as the doctrine of humours which was an extremely important concept in ancient medicine and the doctrine of humours was actually invented or we believe that or we're told that it was invented by the Greek physician Hippocrates around four or five hundred years before the Christian era so hundreds of years later Thanesia wrote a book about the doctrine of humours and this diagram here represents his basic knowledge of that doctrine and it's the same kind of diagram that we saw in the previous picture but now instead of being applied to minerals and metals we're seeing that same doctrine applied to the human constitution on the left here we see the symbol of sulfur and a little boiling flask or uh, alembic and curcubite and a fume arising out of it and on the right we see another alembic with a little symbol of mercury at the top and another fume so these are the same fumes from the rosarium but they are now saying that these same fumes which they believe are inside the earth and compose all metals and minerals are also inside of human beings and govern the human constitution and so we see two fumes the entire system divided into four which is four elements and these four elements in human beings were seen as manifesting in the blood in the bile and in the phlegm and we can also see of course that there was an astrological component to the system at the same time we also see that all humans are both male and female and that of course this whole system exists inside of all females and all males so basically Thunesia was telling us that in at least in his opinion or he was telling us that he was writing about a long tradition of the idea of the relationship between pyrolytic alchemy and the medicine or medical practice medical doctrine of his day very important concept later still about another hundred years down the line we see the German Michael Mayer produced a book called Symbola Aurea Mense and it was published in Frankfurt in 1617 and basically the book was a series of instructions that were given in diagrams like this um, engravings um, on the process of the great work or making of the philosopher's stone and that a number of these diagrams included famous individuals in them that were associated with alchemical tradition pointing out certain aspects of the great work and in this particular diagram here we see Mary the Jewess who is the oldest source written about specifically who we know practiced and taught alchemy Mary the Jewess and Zosimos of Panopolis talked about her and here we see her standing next to a little representation of a mountain and an alchemical symbology this mountain represents the crude matter or natural substance which is taken to make the philosopher's stone out of and we are being shown here in this diagram that inside in the heart of this mountain or the substance which is taken to make the philosopher's stone 
is like a container which breathes out two fumes and up here is a receptacle which catches these fumes so we're being told that these fumes come out of this mountain also that they are contained within this mountain or the mountain is composed of these two fumes and in the middle here we see a five flowered herb and in alchemical symbology flowers represent crist crystals they are considered to be the flowers of the mineral kingdom so this represents a kind of a salt here that is crystallized so we have three things shu tefnut and nebatecha in the earth moisture heat and the earth same thing being talked about and we know that this picture represents pyrolytic alchemy, the very first stage of the work, which is the pyrolytic destruction of the so-called chaos. So we know that Michael Mayer's book, Symbola Aurea Mense, is describing to us the acetate path and pyrolytic alchemy. Okay, so in the same book, in one of the other plates, we see this diagram here. And the famous individual in this diagram is said to be Thomas Aquinas, another famous alchemist. And he's doing the same thing, more or less, that Mary the Jewess was doing. He's pointing at a little model of a mountain, which symbolically represents the crude matter or natural substance which is taken to make the stone off but it's also telling us that this is the earth mountains rocks um, soil and that the earth and all these substances in the earth have inside them two fumes because we can see the mountain is cut away here and we're looking into the center of it and in the center of this mountain we see the sulfuric fume and the mercurial fume rising on top of this little mountain is an alchemist and he is mucking about with an athenor and although you might not be able to see it clearly on the top of the athenor is a little crucible and crucible is a symbol for extreme heat in alchemy and a fume is rising out of the flames and the crucible and this is telling us that the alchemist has taken a substance which is represented by this mountain and he is heating it to extreme degrees and it is releasing a fume and so we are being led to understand that there is a relationship between this fume and these two fumes In other words, the two fumes that are inside the earth, or inside the mountain, from which the mountain is composed, these fumes can be released from this earth or this mountain by heating it. So this little engraving here is telling us again that Michael Mayer is discussing pyrolytic alchemy and the acetate path here Just a little time later a decade or so later a man by the name of Daniel Stolkius wrote a book called Hortulus Hermeticus and it was basically one part of the book had a number of diagrams just like this one little shields that had a saying in Latin around the outside and a little symbolic picture in the middle and each shield was attributed to a famous individual connected with alchemy just like Michael Mayer's book but a more simplified version of it so this shield here from Daniel's book 
was attributed to Maria Hebrea, in other words, Mary the Jewess, Moses' sister. And here we see in a much more simplified form the same diagram that we saw in the Thomas Aquinas picture and in the Mary the Jewess picture. A little mountain, two receptacles, here in this case they're crucibles, two fumes, a herb with five flowers on it growing out of the top of the mountain. It grows out of the top of the mountain because symbolically the highest part or the most purest part of the mountain is represented by these flowers which are symbolical of crystallization of a mineral. And we see the motto around here says, it translates into English as fume gets embraced by fume and the herb keeps both of them. We know these two fumes represent Shu and Tefnut, and the herb or the crystallized mineral represents the god Nebetetcha. The earth embraces the fumes. In other words, the fumes live inside the mountain, and the mountain is actually made out of these fumes that are reduced into a fixed state. So the mountain embraces the fumes. But also, in the, at the reverse end of the work, once everything is separated and purified, when we go to reunite all the pieces of the puzzle back together again to make the Philosopher's Stone, the earth drinks up or embraces these fumes and takes them into itself, and then becomes a complete substance. So, in 1627, by a different author, we see the same concept. And we know that Daniel Stolichius is talking about pyrolytic alchemy and the acetate path of alchemy. So this, of course, is a long way from elaborating in detail every example from history or even a good number of examples from history of concepts associated with pyrolysis and the acetate path or the work of Saturn or the work of the vegetable stone and how that knowledge has crept into important esoteric texts and the creation myths the best example, of course, of which is the first ten opening verses of the Old Testament, Genesis. I think, though, that within the amount of time that I can politely present any idea in one of these podcasts that I have at least given a reasonable argument that these cultures are all linked together, that a thread of teaching has come down through these cultures into the present age, and that this thread of teaching contains basically one system of knowledge and one practical application of that knowledge that this secret esoteric system is firmly related to or has sprung out of a knowledge of pyrolytic alchemy, that there is something about pyrolysis itself and its relationship to medicine or f esoteric pharmacology which caused the ancients to develop a whole philosophical system 
based on what they learned about pyrolysis or what they believed was going on in relation to pyrolysis. That this system has pretty much been passed down from adept to student through history for at least four and a half thousand years almost unchanged. The same concepts that we see highly veiled in the Enuma Elish, the book of the evolutions of Ra, the book of Genesis, the same system that we see highly veiled in those creation mythologies is still being taught in the same way in the Dark Ages, in medieval Europe and during the Renaissance and is beginning to emerge again in our own time. The same system. This is the backbone of my argument about the importance of pyrolytic alchemy of the acetate path itself and of alchemy's relationship to hermetism because one of the things that we can say about the secret thread of teaching that has come down to us through the ages is that it is the hermetic tradition it's the core of the Hermetic tradition. It is the basis for all of the ideas which are presented in Hermetism. And it very likely had its beginning in ancient Sumer or in a culture which pre-existed the Sumerian culture. And today, so far, the only recorded evidence, the earliest recorded evidence that we have of that tradition is found in scattered fragments in the writings and artwork of the Sumerian culture. So I think that's about all for this podcast. I haven't sat down and actually planned the next podcast yet but the subject material that I'm going to cover there will be the middle stage of the acetate path work and I'll go into some detail about exactly what that involves and also what it meant to the old alchemists and then uh, we'll probably switch to the next subject as I'm not going to discuss in detail the very end of the acetate path although I may um, discuss it in passing um, some of the basic ideas that are associated with the end of the acetate path work. I also just want to give notice that next month in November I will be away for two weeks filming a documentary. Uh, one of my advanced students is coming to New Zealand for advanced instruction and he'll be here for two weeks. We're taking a road trip from Napier where I live up to the very top of the North Island and back. It's about an 1800 kilometer journey. Going to do a bit of fishing and a bit of lounging around in the backcountry, freshwater fishing and surf casting and while we're doing that I will be giving him his training, his advanced training to take him up to the first advanced level of Herodim's work and we'll be filming the entire trip and splitting all that film footage into two documentaries one of which will be a kind of a tourist vlog of what it's like to do a road trip in the upper north island of New Zealand 
and so that will be completely exoteric in nature just for the fun of it and the other documentary will be esoteric where, where we will be discussing the history of occultism for want of a better word in New Zealand and particularly in the area where I live because its history goes back almost a thousand years here and discussing the details of my advanced students advanced training and I will be giving him a bunch of inner work sessions while he's here and we'll be talking generally about the history of the Heredom group and my personal history the personal history of my journey as well in detail so that will be an interesting documentary to film and I'm sure it'll be an interesting and educational documentary to see so um, next month while we're filming that and probably spending a great deal of t my spare time editing um, I may not have another podcast next month so it might not be till December that I get out the podcast on the middle stage of the acetate path. And I will keep everybody updated about the documentaries and when they're going to be released. Um, there'll be a few trailers or spoilers posted while we're on the road in real time. And uh, as we get the editing done, there'll be trailers about the actual documentaries themselves so I'll be posting links to those on my email forum for anyone who watches the podcast who is on the email forum while we're on the road I'll be posting links to those um, spoilers or trailers and I will talk about them as I post the next few podcasts here um, giving everybody who's not on the forum but only watches the podcasts access to the URLs for those spoilers. So thanks again for watching and uh, watch out for me in the next few spoiler posts and in podcast 28 sometime in December.